Today it's my uh, distinct uh, privilege and pleasure to introduce one of my classmates, class of uh, 82, uh, Dr. Mark Bugnitz. After, after finishing uh, medical school, he went to uh, PEDS internship and residency at Cardinal Glennon in St. Louis, and then uh, did a critical care fellowship at Denver Children's Hospital. From there, he, went, he became uh, professor uh, of pediatrics at the University of Tennessee in Memphis, and uh, has gradually assumed the medical directorship of the ECMO program and uh, residency program director. Serves on multiple committees within the hospital. Well, let me give you a little personal insight <laughs> into Mark. Mark was one of these guys in medical school. There were guys we called gunners. Oh, you remember yeah. gunners? You probably called them something else. Mark was one of the brighter guys, yeah. but I would in no way call him a gunner. Mark was selfless. He was uh, always willing to uh, help other people. Damn fine guy. <laughs> well, I got to tell one story about him, and I, and I do this with a tremendous amount of risk because he's going to have the microphone for about an hour here. And he's, I'm sure turnabout's fair play. Recall going from your, uh, uh, your base years to the clinical years. I start off on your first clinical rotation. Mine was Peds clinic, but uh, Dr. Bugness went to the GYN clinic. His first patient, first examination, everything was going very smoothly until uh, resident reaches over, whispers in his ear, next time put some gloves on, Bugness. This ain't the back seat of your Chevy. Now the actual story was, I had the glove on this hand, and I went like this. He grabbed my hand, pulled it back, and then we went on. And as we left the room, he says to me, Dr. Bugness, this is a GYN clinic, not the drive-in. <laughs> and then it gets worse. One of my, at grad, night before graduation, uh, our, one of our classmates picked to give the review of four years. My mother's there, my father's there, my wife's there. And he decides to tell that story in front of 500 of my closest friends, and it was somewhat embarrassing. But So that's one of the main reasons I went into um, pediatric intensive care is I haven't done a pelvic since then. So <laughs> it's a good thing. So I, I'm going to talk today about ECMO. In the audience, who knows what ECMO is or has heard of ECMO? So you've heard of it. Good, so about half. Um, I'm going to just give you a little bit um, about the history of it, how it developed, the difficulty. It kind of goes to Dr. Moore's talk this morning is the difficulty in doing double-blind randomized studies or even randomized studies in, in therapies that have been used that people believe work. And, and you'll know what I'm talking about in, in a minute. Um, we call ECMO, it stands for extracorporeal outside of membrane oxygenation, which basically um, we call the ultimate out-of-body experience. And so basically it's a long-term heart-lung machine. So but before I get started, um, just a little bit about where I'm from. This is Lebanon Children's Medical Center. Most people, when they think of Memphis, they think of St. Jude and don't realize we take care of kids without cancer. And this is our brand new Spick and Span Hospital. The hospital is all excited because we were just named the top 25 children's hospitals in America. I think that just means we filled out all the right paperwork. Um, we have a catchment area, which in, in actually goes into Missouri. We cover into Carothersville, the boyhood home of Cedric the Entertainer, and Kennett, Missouri, and Braggadocio. Kennett's the home of Cheryl Crow, and we cover that area and, and a large, about a million kids. So we have a very active pediatric uh, program down there. Memphis is known, as you know, barbecue. Corky's is my favorite. There's about 20 of them. There's a really good one in the hood called Neely's um, that has beef barbecued ribs, which are quite good. We also, as you know, have Elvis. And he really is dead. Uh, one of my uh, friends who's in internal medicine actually coded him. He came into Baptist Hospital. They didn't even recognize him because he was so big and bloated until they saw Dr. Nick in the corner. And um, the doctor who resuscitated him got offered $2,500 for the NG contents by National Enquirer. So, so he really is dead. He's not in Kalamazoo working in a quick shop. Okay, I'm pressing. So, start with the case. 1975, three kilo, 3.6 kilo male, born at 42 weeks, meconium stain fluid. He's in immediate respiratory distress, intubated, hyperventilated with high peak inspiratory pressures, 100% oxygen transferred to the NICU. His postductive PO2, meaning the oxygen after the duct dumps in, is 35 on 100% oxygen. Back then, they did something called a bubble test where they would squirt some saline in your IV and they'd see the bubbles go across the ASD. And they determined that he had what we called back then persistent fetal circulation. His AA gradient was 620, meaning the big A is the oxygen in his alveoli, the little A is the oxygen in his artery. The difference is over 620. What that tells you is he's not putting a lot of blood past his lungs, and that's just an indication. At that point in time, back in the 70s, 
by historical controls, 80 to 90% of these kids have died. And this is important because meconium aspiration is the leading cause of pulmonary hypertension in the newborn uh, with about 1,000 cases a year. So back then, 80 to 90% of these kids died, and of the survivors who got conventional therapy, there were about 25% of them had neurologic compromise of some sort. Same baby born in 2012 has 90 to 95% survival. So marked difference. A large part of this difference is because of ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, uh, which basically is a long and hard lung machine that the babies are put on to let their lungs rest. So, let me know what this is. This is the original heart lung machine um, invented by John Gibbon in 1954, and you can see it's much different than the machines now. This is a picture of him with a patient who went on, um, on uh, the heart lung machine. It was an ASD repair, and this is her uh, after the case. And this is actually, this is the membrane lung. So compare that to what things are now. But before 1954, they didn't have this technology. So from then on, you could go on this machine for about an hour to get very simple heart surgeries. The problem was that the oxygen was bubbled into the blood. So there's a reservoir and the oxygen was bubbled in. So after about an hour, the red cells started breaking down. And as the red cells started breaking down, your kidneys stopped working, your brain stopped working. So you could get it for an hour. And actually some of the first documented cases, after an hour, people were going blind. And so obviously there was a, there was a limit on what you could do with this machine. So in the 60s, they developed the silicon rubber semipermeable membrane. And what that did is it separated the blood phase from the gas phase. So you blow the gas by, the blood would go the other way, and, the, and just simple diffusion like your lung, the oxygen would be dumped into the blood, and the blood would go, go back out the circuit. You could keep patients on for hours, 10, 12 hours. And so that was kind of, as things happened, cabbages and all these other surgeries began to take hold. So, and you, you, since you weren't mixing the oxygen, the red blood cells were doing fine. In 71, 28 year old guy, uh, trauma, developed bad ARDS, and at that point in time, the, the mortality from ARDS was between 50 and 70 percent. They took this guy, sit down, wait. They took this guy, <laughs> and, and I'm trying to talk here. Um, <laughs> they took this guy and they put him on ECMO. They said he's going to die anyway, let's try it. So they put him on ECMO and he survived. And so, you got a disease that's 70 percent, 60 percent mortality. They said maybe this is the new way to save these kids, these guys. So the NIH in '91 said we'll sponsor a study of ECMO, which extracorporeal life support became known as ECMO, and we'll we'll sponsor a study. So they had like nine or ten centers, and they looked at all these patients with ARDS, and what they found was that the survival was survival was dismal, 10 percent in each group. So at that point, they said, well, obviously this ECMO stuff doesn't work. So for about the next 15, 20 years, nobody was doing ECMO on adults. The problem with this study was there were like five or six different machines used. And they were putting these guys on after 10 days on the ventilator. So the damage had probably been done. And they didn't, they didn't really know how to do ECMO very well. And so it wasn't really a very good study. But NIH funded. And from then on, people said, we're not going to do ECMO on adults, unfortunately. So during this same time, there's a guy named um, Robert Bartlett who had gone, he was at Hopkins and then he moved out to UC Irvine. And he was wondering if could you use this technology on neonates? Because at that time, as I showed you the first the case, neonates were dying in high proportion with pulmonary hypertension. And so he started working with the technology and he reported in 76 in the transactions of the American Society of Artificial Internal Organs, I didn't know until that time there was such a thing, um, in April 76, he reported on 13 patients, nine had respiratory failure, few of them had heart disease, and he had four survivors. And the four survivors were meconium aspiration syndrome patients with pulmonary hypertension. So this is basically what the circuit is. And aside from a lot of whistles and bells that have been added over the last 30 years, it's pretty much the same. What he did was he put a catheter into the internal jugular down to the aortic arch. He put another catheter deep into the right atrium. So the the blood comes out, goes to this, what's called a, a bladder. It's basically servo regulates the pump. And then you can add it. It's like the ultimate IV access. You can put all kinds of stuff if you want. Then it goes through the pump. So from the baby to the pump, it's gravity. Then the pump actively pumps the blood in here, and the gas phase is going this way. So you got anywhere from 100% six percent oxygen coming this way, blood going that way. So you can imagine the gradient for oxygenation, it's huge. It's about 700 versus 
about 40. The gradient for CO2, not so huge, 45 versus zero, so you have to have that air moving through to ventilate. So if your gases aren't good, your CO2 is too high, what do you do? You hyperventilate. How do you hyperventilate the pump? You just turn up the little knob up there and run more gas through. And then since the blood's been outside the body for a while, you have to go through heat exchanger and then back in the body. All right. The issues here are, there's a lot of plastic and stuff in there, so you gotta be heparinized. So you have to be anticoagulated, and so therefore, the risk is that if you bleed somewhere, you're gonna really bleed somewhere. And that was the initial risk. Um, the other issue is when you take these guys out at the end of your run, you ligate the crud and ligate the internal jugular. All right? So by 82, and um, awesome. Okay. See, people our age and older shouldn't be allowed to have phones because they can never figure out how to silence them. You're sitting in church, you know, and, it, and, and the 70 year old lady's going, <laughs> anyway. Okay. So how does it work? All right, it's kind of magic, basically. What we know is these kids come in in the, in the 70s, 80s, they, and even up to the early 90s, they would come in and you would just pound the heck out of their lungs. You'd put on high PIPs, you'd get their CO2 down to 25, you'd get their pH up to 7.5, you'd put on 100% oxygen, and you just pound the heck out of them. So they, if they didn't die of right heart failure from hypertension, they died of lung disease later on. So what, what you do with ECMO is, the minute we go on VA ECMO, is you put them on room air, you put them on maybe a PIP of 15 or 20, PEEP of 5 or 10, and a rate of 5 or 10. And it's all you do. So their lungs aren't moving, and you're doing all the work with the ECMO. And you correct their acidosis, you correct hypoxemia, you correct hypercarbia within 10 minutes with the ECMO circuit. And by doing that, you decrease injury, you decrease mediator release. And we know, and, and this is a fact, you echo them four days into this, their pulmonary hypertension is gone. Now, with the meconiums, with some others, maybe not so much, but we know that, that when you echo them, if everything runs well, their pulmonary hypertension goes away. And so this is the theory behind it. So by 82, he had done about 50 kids, 45 kids with a 55% survival. And they were, the survivors were almost all meconium aspiration or some sort of pulmonary hypertension. So it became clear that the disease to treat with this was pulmonary hypertension in the newborn. However, this is early 80s, and the neonatologists around the country were very skeptical. I mean, you're taking, you're taking our babies, and you're cutting their carotids, and you're cutting their IJ, and you're ligating them, and you're putting them on this machine, and they're all going to bleed and die. There hadn't been a randomized study yet. Despite that, some of the younger neonatologists and some of the ones who were really frustrated with, with inability to cure these kids started to develop their own centers. So by the mid-80s, there were 20 or so centers. But there was no randomized trial. So, Bartlett was a believer. He'd been studying this stuff for 20 years. So he knew that he needed a randomized trial to convince the others that it worked, but he felt ethically that he couldn't randomize because he knew ECMO worked. He, he just did. So here's what he did. He did something called the randomized play the winner randomization. So bear with me. You take a hat. Notice the appropriate hat. You take one card with ECMO, and you take another card with conventional, all right? So you put them in the hat. So you draw out one. First patient comes in, meets your entry criteria. You draw, you close your eyes, pull out. Conventional. If the patient survives, you take a second conventional and you put it in the hat. Now the next patient has a two-thirds chance of going on conventional and a one-third chance of going on ECMO. Okay, let's say that the first patient goes on conventional and he dies, all right? You leave that one in there, and you put a second ECMO in. So his point was, he didn't want to keep doing something that he felt wasn't right, so this was how he randomized. So guess what happens, all right? So first patient comes in, meets, meets ECMO criteria, or meets, meets criteria, gets conventional, dies. He puts that in, puts this in. Second patient comes in, gets ECMO, he survives. He puts another one in, he puts another one in, he puts another one in. He did 12 patients. 11 got ECMO and survived. One got conventional and died. So what was his conclusion? In a randomized study, ECMO was superior to conventional, <laughs> conventional treatment. That's what his conclusion was. And he, of course, got lambasted in the literature, but you can understand him. I mean, this guy been studying this 20 years. He was convinced it worked. And this is the way he thought he could randomize while it didn't work. So. What happens next is by, he's, he's by 86, he's done 100 kids. 
72% survival in patients with a predicted mortality of 80 to 90% based on historical controls. That's the important part. And what he noticed was persistent fetal circulation, now known as pulmonary hypertension, the persistent pulmonary hypertension, newborn, 100% survival. Surprisingly, his condensed diaphragmatics had 7 out of 9 meconium, very good survival. Newborns with RDS, not so good. But what he noticed is if he did a baby under 35 weeks, 9 out of 10 of them bled in their head. All right. So from that point on, everybody stopped doing preemies. And basically, 36 weeks or above would go on ECMO. All right. So what's the pathogenesis? Well, nobody still really knows. You're taking a baby who's hypoxic acidotic, who's probably hypotensive, and then you're taking these two big things and stuck, sticking them in their neck, and now you're changing the total way that they perfuse. You're ligating their carotids, so they're not getting any direct perfusion here. You're obstructing their um, jugular, so you're getting an increased CVP that's transmitted back up. You're also, they're already hemodynamically and probably cerebrovascular and unstable, and then you're heparinizing them. And like I said, the CVP's increased. So all these reasons were, were thrown out as possible causes of bleeding in the head. So by 89, over 2,400 kids are treated. ELSA, which is the extracorporeal life support organization, was founded. And basically what that is is we're all in it. We have to send all of our data into this data bank to show everybody what's going on and, and all the complications and everything. So that was founded then. At the time, of the, at 89, it was an 80% survival. Once again, in patients with that 80% predicted mortality based on historical controls. And there was still an instance about 15% of intracranial hemorrhage or infarct. Still, no randomized trial. And this is why neonatologists remain skeptical even as late as this. Now, as an aside, when I was um, in 1987, I was finishing my fellowship, I got a phone call from my future division chief. He said, hey, you want to start an ECMO program? I was 31 and stupid. And I said, sure, yeah. Well, what I didn't realize, I spent a year and a half putting pigs on ECMO, um, sleeping in the lab, and then I spent the first year being the only one who knew how to do ECMO. My wife got to the point where she called ECMO the four-letter word. Um, <laughs> but I did learn one important veterinary fact. When you chase a pig, if you grab them by the back leg and hold them up, they play dead. And so you can get them to do whatever you want. So, so you get something out of it. All right. So, so Pearl O'Rourke, who was in Boston at the time, decided that Bartlett's study wasn't very good and she was going to do her own study. So their study was designed with patient pulmonary hypertension of a number of different diagnoses, meconium, pure pulmonary hypertension, um, sepsis. She did not include congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So their plan was to get all these patients enrolled and they were going to say when four patients died in either group, they were going to stop the study because they once, kind of like Bartlett, they kind of were believers. So what happened was they did 19 patients, 9 out of 9 ECMO survived, 6 out of 10 conventional survived. But remember what I told you earlier in three different slides, the predicted mortality of all these people, all these first 15 years of ECMO, was that 90% of these kids are going to die if we don't put them on ECMO. Well, only 40% died. So somewhere in between there is really the, the truth. But they did this, and they found that, in, in the, and they looked at four different ways to decide if they would die, and they still were wrong by about 40, 50%. So once again, still people were skeptical, and now you've only got one randomized study with only 19 patients, which says that ECMO is better than conventional. So there's big concern now, because remember, I told you, you're cutting off the right carotid, basically. And if you look at this, the way you're perfusing the other side, you're coming up here and you're going through this little bitty anterior communicating artery to perfuse the side of the neck that's not ligated, or that's ligated. So there was a lot of worry about long term. What does this mean? Are you going to get bleeds here? Are you going to get aneurysms here? Something happened. So the first major change in ECMO was the development of what was called venovenous ECMO. All right. In this technique, you have either two sides, but most places you use a dual lumen. You just cannulate the internal jugular and you spare the carotid, but you don't get any cardiac support. Now, these kids are coming in very sick, their heart's failing, and everybody thought if we don't put them on VA, they would die of their heart failure. What they found was that if you put them on VV and oxygenated them and ventilated them, their blood pressure got better, their heart function got better, and you can wean them off their pressors. So it seemed like a pretty good thing. The other thing is, is now you're putting direct, more oxygenated blood into the pulmonary artery 
because you're taking 100% oxygenated blood, you get the venous return blood, it's all mixing in the right atrium, but it's higher than normal, and maybe that'll cause some venous relax or some pulmonary relaxation. So that was the advantage. The disadvantage is no cardiac support was the main disadvantage. So there were some studies done. This is what you do. It's essentially the same ECMO technology, but one cannula sits in the middle of the right atrium. And there's a hole at the end and the side holes. The side holes suck the blood out, the hole at the end pushes the blood back in. All right? And so you can see it's, it's pretty much exactly what it looks like. All right? So people said, well, that seems like a good thing to do if we don't have to uh, light the carotid. The problem is you're still going to ligate the internal jugular and you're still going to have elevated pressures in the head. And so people were saying, well, maybe it's not just the carotid that's the problem. So Anderson and all did this study. And they looked at 135 patients on VV ECMO and 108 on VA ECMO. And this is survival. So the survival was as good at least. Now, caveat to this is if you were hypotensive, you got put on VA ECMO. Well, if you were hypotensive, you were probably sicker. So the sicker ones went on VA ECMO may explain why the VVs are better. But at least what they showed was the VVs were as good as VA ECMO. Now, in terms of neurologic complications, although they look like they may be different, statistically there was no difference, but seizures and infarct occurred a little less in the, in the VV and the VA. So it works as well, we think, and maybe the complications are less, but not statistically. So these guys want to know, well, is there a change in neuro outcome? So Van Muris took 24 VVs and then historical 24 matched VAs, matched in terms of degree of lung disease, to premature, et cetera, you know, whatever. And then they followed only for 15 months. They compared their developmental outcome and their intracranial abnormalities on, on scans, and they were equal. So you would think we keep our carotid and we just have one catheter. You can pull it out, put a center line, and you think that it would kind of take off. So here's the most recent data. This is cumulative, all right? This is VA ECMO. It was about, back then, about 22% was VV double lumen. This is this year. Everybody's still doing VA. Now, at our center, we do VV on everybody. And we found that our survival is just as good and our neuro outcome seems to be as good. But I was shocked, because I hadn't seen this data until I started working on this talk. I was shocked. I thought it was going to be more like 50, 50, 60, 40 VV. It just makes more sense. But people, VA is great because you put them on, they got heart support, they got lung support, and you can go to bed. I mean, and I, I still think that's part of the issue is people, it's easier to take care of a patient on VA than VV because you don't have to worry about the heart anymore. So this is where we are currently in the VV. So what went on in the 90s that changed things? Well, people were still looking for alternative therapies. People were trying prostacycline as a pollen raise a dollar. People were trying other things. And general ventilation kind of started to become... Uh, more in vogue, where you would try to put them on a little lower pressures, a little lower oxygen, tolerate CO2, permit hypercapnia. That didn't really catch on. The two things that really seemed to change were high frequency oxygen ventilation and inhaled ox nitric oxide. Everybody knows what a high frequency oxygen ventilation is. Basically, you run them anywhere from a rate of 360 to a rate of 600. The advantage is it doesn't oxygenate or ventilate better. What it does is allows you to get mean airway pressure without the big swings in volume, which we know cause chronic lung disease and, and lung damage. And then inhaled nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a pulmonary vasodilator. It directly goes to where you want it to go. So if this area of lung isn't ventilated, you don't want to vasodilate in there. So it goes just where you want to vasodilate to the places that are ventilated. And it's immediately neutralized by hemoglobin, so there's no systemic effect. So it's pretty much the perfect pulmonary vasodilator if that's what you're looking for. So Carter described 50 patients who were admitted to their center for ECMO, and they offered all 50 of them high frequency. 46 parents signed up, 21 didn't need ECMO. Interestingly enough, the mortality was exactly the same in both groups. So it, it kept them with ECMO, but it didn't keep them from dying, so maybe they would have been better off on ECMO. But this is what they found. So from early 90s on, everybody started using high frequency oscillatory ventilation. Once again, like a lot of things we do in medicine, especially in ICU, we do stuff that doesn't really have a whole lot of scientific basis our research, but we, we know it works, so we do it. So everybody started in high frequency. Interestingly, in a Cochrane review done in 07, there's been only two controlled randomized studies, and neither one showed an advantage of high frequency. Despite that, everybody's doing it. And so once, it's like, like Dr. Morris talked about this morning, it's difficult in these really sick babies in intensive care to truly randomize sometimes, because if, if, if you're convinced it works, 
you're going to have a hard time saying, well, let's randomize them to that one that I don't think works. And so that's where people were with all this, is, is they were convinced it worked. So although no advantage and only two studies done, high frequency has become standard of care for these patients before they could put on ECMO. So this was kind of the big break. John Kinsella in Denver was kind of the, he's kind of the guru of this. He described in Lancet, along with another guy from, from England who was doing the same stuff, that if he put patients who are hypoxemic with pulmonary hypertension on inhaled nitric oxide, they got better. That's all it said. They got better. Their oxygenation improved. So over the next 10 years, numerous studies done. Robertson, a study, and basically their study was just to show that you could lower their, you could improve their oxygenation uh, with nitric oxide. That's about all they did. Then these two studies basically randomized. This had about 100 patients in. This one had about 250 patients in. And they randomized. Patients came in and they either got, they got placebo or nitric oxide. And what they found was, yes, you could lower pulmonary pressure, and yes, you could increase oxygenation, but neither one of these two studies found a change in mortality even though they got better. And they also showed a marked decrease in the patients who ended up going on ECMO. But no change in survival. This is a bigger study, and what they found was, and these two studies, once again, didn't do congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Everybody knows what congenital diaphragmatic hernia is? Before 16 weeks of gestation, your guts are in your chest, and your lung doesn't develop on this side hardly at all, and this lung's abnormal, and you have hypoplasia and you have pulmonary hypertension. So a little different than the other, other patients who mostly have pulmonary hypertension, they have hypoplasia to a certain extent. This study with Clark, they included bifermatic hernia and found that most of them didn't respond to nitric. But they also found that most of the patients, more than half, could be kept off ECMO. So it really changed the numbers. Then these guys can sell again, and Chris do in critical care, they found, both doing studies on I and O, but also including high frequency, they found that the patients in a crossover study, if you gave them high frequency and nitric, they did better than either high frequency by themselves or nitric by themselves. And the ones who did the best were those with parenchymal lung disease, like meconium aspiration, et cetera. So from then on, what people do now is they come in, either an ECMO center or not, start the high frequency, recruit the lung, give them the nitric oxide, and hope they get better. And then if they don't, they go on ECMO. Well, what have we seen? Back to that, I skipped one. So 1996, after 13,000 babies had been treated with ECMO, there was finally a multicenter randomized study. It was done in England. It was never going to happen here. And what, what they did was they had five ECMO centers in the entire UK. And if you got randomized to conventional, you stayed home. If you got randomized to ECMO, you traveled anywhere from five hours by ambulance to 12 hours by helicopter to, they, they, that was part of the deal. And so, even with that, the survival in the ECMO group was much better than the survival in, in the conventional group. Now, even more interesting, of the 93 that got sent for ECMO, 15 either died before they got there, were too sick to go on, or had some congenital abnormality. So in fact, 63 out of 78 who actually got ECMO survived, as opposed to 38 out of 93. So this is the, the only, the first and only randomized clinical multi-center study on ECMO that shows that ECMO works better than conventional on pulmonary hypertension. So out of 25,000 now treated, it's the only study. So what's happened since? Well, if you look, these are, the, these are year, the year runs of ECMO. 1992 it peaked. Well, what happened in 1992? Kinsella described nitric oxide. So from then on, it's pretty much gone on to level out to where it's around a peak of over 1,500 a year to now a peak of only about 750 to 800. So markedly decreased, which makes it hard because if you think about ECMO program, you've got coordinators, you've got respiratory therapists, you've got nurses, you've got pumps that cost a lot of money, you've got training, retraining. You've got a lot of these ECMO centers saying, we've got all these people. <laughs> now we've got this problem for the ECMO centers. Good for the patients, not so much for the ECMO centers. So this is the current, the total 2012, what's happened? Congenital diaphragmatic is second to meconium. So if you look, oop, let me go back. If you look over here, worst outcome, best outcome. 94% for meconium with pulmonary hypertension. So no matter what we've done, the survival for congenital diaphragmatic has actually gone down a little with ECMO. And that's really a problem. Um, everything else, if you look at the numbers, not too bad. Pneumonia 
is, is worse, but our Frank's the worst. So overall, that's what's happened. Now, don't, don't look at everything. All I want you to look at is 1992-1500. Now, 2 twelfths and 12 is not the whole year. 787 last year. But what I want you to look at is in 88, 85% survival. Now we're in the 60s. So why would you think that is? Anybody? Hmm? Not doing premies. See, I think that's probably part of it is what we've done is we've selected not all the kids that aren't going to be reversed very easily and we're putting them on ECMO. There's several, I'll give you my theories and some of what other people have thrown out there. We used to do 15 to 20 a year neonatal pulmonary hypertension space. We're doing 7 to 10. So, and I'm bringing new attendings in who I've taken care of 200 of these kids because I started the program. So I, I'm pretty comfortable. You bring a new attending in who's just going to have fellowship at a place where they're doing less ECMO and now he's the attending. He may not be making the right decisions or the same ones that I would make who've been doing this. You have less experience ECMO specialists. Every patient has an ECMO specialist sitting at the bedside at the pump 24-7 and a nurse. If that specialist isn't as in tune as they used to be because they were doing 20 or 30 or 10 or 15 and they're doing maybe twice a year, they're less experienced. And I would argue that probably their effectiveness is less. Like you said, patients who don't respond to INO on high frequency, they probably have worse disease. I mean, or they would have responded. Also, some would argue, the true ECMO believers would argue, that you guys are treating them too long with INO and high frequency, trying to get them better, and all you're doing is making their lung injury worse, and so by the time you get them to me, what do I got to do for them? So they would argue that. And then finally, the percentage of congenital diaphragmatic hernias being done has is, is gotten more than anything else now, and we know they have the worst survival. So all of these, I think, go together to basically say, the prognosis is worse, but is it because, you know, why is it worse, and are we still saving a lot of kids? I would argue, and once again, anecdotal, which that and 50 cents will get you maybe a cup of coffee somewhere. I would argue that we're doing better with ECMO, and we're just, and the, we're saving half of the kids that are sent to us for ECMO don't go on ECMO and survive. So I would argue that we're just selecting out the sicker kids, just in my experience. Once again, that's anecdotal and doesn't hold any water anywhere. So what about neurologic complications? I'll finish up with this. All there is 14% of patients who go on have either hemorrhage or infarct by ultrasound. 10% have seizures, and if you combine all that, the survival in that group of patients is less than 50%. So this still remains the bugaboo of ECMO is the intracranial issue. Penny Glass did follow-up on just ECMO patients at five years. She found that 15% had a major disability or handicap, 5% severe. So around a 15 or 20. But then the question is, well, what about the ones who don't go on ECMO compared to the ECMO? Well, there's only been one study that compared ECMO and conventional, and that was in England. So they looked. 76% of all of their survivors, ECMO, non-ECMO, had a cognitive level within the normal range. Learning problems were similar in both groups, but there seemed to be an increased risk of behavioral problems in the conventional group. And when you look at the older studies they looked, basically of conventionally treated patients, they had about a 20-20% incidence of some kind of learning disability or mental retardation. And if you look at a large number of ECMO survivors, their IQ is in the normal range, but it's low normal. So the question is, how much is related to ECMO and how much, and this was their conclusion, their study, which just came out in 07. The underlying disease appears to be a major influence. Now, caveat to that is, if I get a kid on ECMO who has a grade three bleed in his head while he's on ECMO, clearly his outcome isn't gonna be as good. But once again, anecdotally, the patients we put on that have a nice, what I call boring ECMO run, they're on for six days, they come off, they appear neurologically normal one to two year follow up. So, summary ECMO is high risk, life saving. It's also very expensive. Probably one week of ECMO is about $200,000 charged to the patient. Um, the use of ECMO is decreased, likely the emergence of two other therapies. VA ECMO remains the technical choice. Survival has decreased in the last 15 years. Meconium has the best prognosis, congenital diaphragmatic worse, and outcome is often related to the underlying disease. So, a little overview and uh, any questions? And I, I want to yell at whoever put me right after lunch because I think I'm being punished for putting the wrong hand in or something. But um, <laughs> any questions? Yeah. Would you discuss that you ligate these vessels? They're on ECMO for six days. 
Why do the vascular guys not go in there and reapproximate? There have been, there are, there are about maybe 10 or 15 percent of centers that reconstruct the carotid. I didn't, I didn't throw that in there because I didn't want to go too long. And they found that the outcome's the same when they looked at them two or three years out. The incidence of bleeds was the same, and the incidence of neurologic um, complications was the same. So a lot of places have just decided it's not worth the aggravation. Um, and then some people worry that the IJ is probably as, as important or more important, and they don't reconstruct the IJ. So it, it's been done by some people, but the results weren't very impressive. It's a good question. No, I think it's a good question. I tried to look at a few years back, look at, at patients who had one carotid ligated in it from trauma or from something, or patients with aneurysms who had ligated carotid. There's very little out there. People with aneurysm de disease, if you ligate, have more aneurysms, but they had aneurysm disease to start with. There's a very little on trauma or other reasons to ligate the carotid, and there wasn't anything impressive in terms of develop aneurysms. Because I would think that little anterior communicating artery at some point in time, you would think that that's going to kind of start going like this. The first survivor is now probably 40, 36. Um, and so I haven't read or seen anything about aneurysm development. I agree with you. You would think that you'd want your carotid. I mean, it's there for a reason, I would think. So. <laughs> Along those same lines, yes. uh, you know, in adults would go on femoral, femoral uh, VA bypass. Is, yeah. it, is it just too small in the, these kids? Yeah, it's way too small. And we'll, if we do, we do some pediatric ECMO, not a lot, because I have to say with the oscillator, we don't lose kids with lung disease near as we did 20 years ago. But we do FEM, we do FEM, FEM, or we'll do FEM, IJ. And, um, but yeah, in a baby, it's too small. The big, I, I once rammed, I'll say it again, rammed a nine French vascath and a neonate because they needed dialysis and, and it was, yeah, it was, Agreed. you know, and so you're not getting enough flow with a double lumen nine or even single lumen nine is probably not going to get it for you either. Other questions? There was an IVOX catheter, I think it was a, in the fear vena cave, it was basically an artificial gill. This is more adult size, but they would do uh, femoral oxygenate or uh, venous oxygenation in the femoral line. I don't, it didn't really take Yeah, we're still, we, we, like I said, the bigger kids we do veno venous that way. Um, and I didn't get into, you know, cardiac ECMO has, has gotten bigger. And I, I kind of think if you look at the numbers, as neonatal has gone down, pediatrics has gone up, cardiac has gone up. And I still wonder if it's, if it's a therapy looking for a disease because we got all this money invested in it, so we got to use it. And what we're doing now, which something is crazy, is it's being used as a bridge to transplant um, for these, these kids, and they'd be on it for, we, we actually don't do transplants yet, so we transfer kids on ECMO to Little Rock. And they, they may sit there for a month or two on ECMO, and then they may go to a Berlin if they're big enough. So it's really changed, the, the dynamic has changed where it's a lot more heart being done and a lot less neonatal being done. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mark.